welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Father, tonight we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for what you've already done in this church service. God, it's just awesome that we get to see so many mighty, powerful moves of your spirit in hearts and lives, God. And I know the testimonies to come, God, are going to be great and mighty of what you did in your house. Lord, tonight we don't want to stop there. We want to keep going. We want to go further with you, go deeper, Father God. And so we pray tonight as we open up your word, God, that you open us up to receive it. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. And God, we praise you and we thank you for that. Lord, give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, the understanding that we need. Correct us, change us, God, motivate us, guide us, guard us, and build us, Father God, to be all that you would have us to be and to do all that you've called us to do. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. God, also we would ask this blessing not only upon ourselves, but also upon all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building one kingdom, and that's yours, Lord. God, we give you all the praise and the glory that you bless them tonight as you would bless us. Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, Amen. Amen. Well, tonight, get your Bibles out and go with me to Exodus, the third chapter. And we're going to be in the very first verse of Exodus, the third chapter. And tonight, I have a message called Looking Away and Looking To. Looking Away, Looking To. And you'll see what that means as we go along tonight. But as I was studying this out and and taking a look at the life of a man of God by the name of Moses, much has been said, much could be said tonight. And tonight, we're just going to kind of get a snapshot, a, a, a brief introduction to his life But there was something that took place in the life of Moses that he looked away and he looked to and his life was never the same. You and I in the same way tonight as we see these principles and as we take a look at the things that happen, as we look away from certain areas and we look to God in other areas, it's going to change our life. I don't know about you, but I don't want to stay the same. I I don't want to stay status quo. I've worked very hard to get where I'm at, but listen, I'm not done yet. And even greater than that is that God is not finished with me yet. Oh, praise the Lord, because if he left me like this, I'd be miserable, because there are still greater things that I believe that God has in my life, as well as in your life, and in the life of this church, that God wants to do, but we're going to have to look away in certain areas and look to in other areas. Exodus chapter 3, verse number 1 says this, it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert. And came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now stop right there for a second. We know the the story of Moses. For those of you that maybe don't know, Moses, when he was born at the time, Pharaoh had commanded that all the Hebrew children under a certain age, when they were born, that they they be slaughtered, they be murdered. And so here Moses was. His parents feared God more than they feared the command of Pharaoh. And so they hid him in a small ark and, and, and they pushed him out into the river. And there in the river, you know the story, Pharaoh's daughter found him and eventually... Here, Moses was nursed by his own mother. He was raised up in Pharaoh's courts for 40 years. And there in Pharaoh's courts, he was trained, and he was brought up as a prince in Egypt. And here, Moses knows that there's a call of God on his life, and he sees an Egyptian mistreating a Hebrew. So what does he do? He goes after him, and he kills him, and he buries him in the sand, thinking that nobody saw. And the next day when he comes up, he sees two of his own brethren fighting. And he says, what are you guys doing? He tries to separate them. And they say, are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptians? So what does he do? He flees for his life. There as he flees, he, he marries. And now here he is tending to the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. The Bible tells us, and it says, and he led the flock to the back of the desert. Here Moses has been in the desert for 40 years. He's 80 years old. And here he is going to a place that's probably very familiar for him. Here he is in his occupation. Here he is in his day-to-day. Here he is with these sheep that he knew. Here he is taking care of someone else's property. And here he is on his way of duty, just going to the backside of the desert. And it says that he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, I want you to notice that when it talks about Horeb, the mountain of God, that everything changes. See, when we get into a place where we can have a God encounter... It sets the stage for the supernatural to happen. That's why we encourage you guys to get into church as much as we do. Because every time you come into a place that God is on the scene, 
It's just the stage for the supernatural to happen. Are you listening tonight? See, some of you guys thought that you were just coming to church as usual tonight. And yet God is in the place, and, and the stage is set for the supernatural to happen. Some of you already came to the altar tonight. Some of you already laid down issues tonight. Some of you ha had, a, had a health issue, and as you brought that health issue forward tonight, you may not have known it, but you are healed tonight. Some of you brought a, a burden tonight. And some of you, as you laid down that burden tonight, and as you brought that to the altar tonight, you didn't realize it, but you rolled it off your back, and you cast that care onto the Lord, and now God's got a hold of it, and God's going to take care of it. And tonight, as we approach the Word of God, how many of you know that this Word, how great and how unsearchable is His wisdom? See, this is the mountain of God that you could climb up and down it, you could go all around it, you could search out every part of it, and still there'd be more to find. And when we open God's Word together, and when we take a look at the promises of God, it sets the stage for the supernatural. Verse number two, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Now, we know this story. We've heard this story. We've seen it on flannel graphs. We've seen images of a little bush and a little fire. And here's Moses, this white-haired man, and, you know, looking. God tells him to take off his sandals for the place where he stands his holy ground. But I want you to notice something, that Moses... Looked. It says, behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Remember, Moses, here he is, his daily occupation. Here he is in his way of duty. Here he is not idle. He, he's got stuff he's doing. He's actually not taking care of his own business. He's taking care of someone else's business. And here on his way of duty, here on his day-to-day, here in the boring, the mundane, but still the activity of life, something happens. Angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. Now, at this point, Moses didn't know that this was the angel of the Lord. All he knew was he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Now, he could have said, hmm, look at that. Kept on going. He could have stopped and said, hmm, interesting. I'll write that down and tell somebody about it later. Kept on going. But he doesn't. He does something, verse number three, that makes all the difference. Look at this. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. See, Moses didn't just see. He said, I'm going to turn aside and see. He didn't just look. He looked away from something. He was a shepherd. He had sheep with him. Sheep unattended will do whatever they want. Sheep will just eat, and then over here they will eat, and then they'll continue to eat, and then they will move over here and eat, and eventually they will wander away from the shepherd. That's why the shepherd was there. That's why he had a rod and a staff. Why? So that he could get a hold of those sheep and bring them back on course. He had that rod. Why? To come against anything that was coming against the sheep. See, there was predators that could come against the sheep. And so a good shepherd does not leave the sheep, but something was taking place. The supernatural was occurring in his midst, and he was wise enough to know that this was not ordinary, that this was not the day-to-day, -day, that something special was taking place. And so what does he do? He says, I will now turn aside, not just look. No, I'm going to look away from my daily occupation. I'm going to look away from the way I was going. I'm going to look away from the duty that I was performing at this point, and now I'm going to look to, I'm going to see this great sight, why the bush does not Burn. See, this is not just curiosity. This is a heartfelt desire. He's saying, I need to understand something. Yeah, curiosity made him look because there was a fire, but it could have been anything. Fire in the desert, that could have happened because lightning struck a dry bush. That could have happened because somebody's camp, you know, they didn't quite stamp out the, the embers a, after they, they left that place, and so it, it, it lit up a, a tree that was by it. See, a little fire could have happened, and he would have looked, and oh, it's just a fire. But no, he looked, and he saw that there was a bush that was burning but was not consumed, and now he turns aside. He looks away from the natural, and he looks to the supernatural. And he says, I'm going to see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. 
Verse number four. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look. You read that again. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look. In other words, if he hadn't turned aside to look, what's about to take place would not have taken place. God was waiting. God could have called Moses the moment that his curiosity peaked. Oh, there's a fire over there. God could have got his attention right at that moment. But God was waiting so that he had his full attention. Not just curiosity, not just interest, but now he had everything. He was captivated. He had turned away from the things, from the natural occupation, and now he had turned to the supernatural that was taking place right in front of him. Now God's got his attention. Now God knows he has all of his interest, and something takes place. It says, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. God goes on to explain to him what's about to take place, that he's going to deliver his people. Now, I want to stop right there because uh, as I look through the Bible, not just in the story of Moses, but in the story of many others that we could name throughout the Bible of Samuel and David and, 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 and Hannah and, and different great mighty men and women of God that, that God intercepted and, and that God interrupted, we, we find that not only does he do those things, he doesn't just intercept and interrupt just to kind of mess with us, you know, uh, even though we, we might think that's kind of funny. God has a purpose. God has a plan. God has a reason why he does what he does. See, God knew what he needed to do to, in order to get Moses' attention and in order to get him off of where he was at. God knew the right timing, too, because 40 years ago, Moses thought it was time that the call upon his life to deliver the people had come. And yet, when he's found out, he flees. And now, for 40 years, he's given the best training he could ever have to lead a people. Think about it. He knew that desert. Knew it so well that he could lead sheep to the backside of the desert. God knew that he needed to get this man out of himself. See, there was a pride of Egypt that was probably raised up on the inside of him, being raised in Pharaoh's courts. But Moses found more of God in the desert than he ever found in Pharaoh's courts. Are you listening tonight? And now here he is in a natural occupation, and he turns aside from that, and he turns and looks and sees. God starts to speak to him. Those whom God intercepts and interrupts, he intercedes and interacts with. God interrupted Gideon there in a wine press. He interrupted him, interacted with him, called him out. God interrupts a little shepherd boy on the hills of Judea, forgotten by his family. Becomes one of the greatest kings that Israel had ever known. God interrupts oftentimes our lives. God knows the time and the season that we're in. Here we are at the beginning of a new year. Here we are in the middle of our occupation. Here we are in our day-to-day. And I believe that God is saying, church, I want you to look away from the natural. It doesn't mean that you neglect your family. Okay, please understand what I'm saying tonight. I'm not telling you to not go to work tomorrow. I'm not telling you to not take your kids to school or, or not eat or do any of that kind of stuff. What I am telling you, though, is that we should not become so fascinated and infatuated with the things of this earth that we look away from God to gaze at the natural. No, God is saying, I want you to look away from the natural and focus on me. What you look at makes all the difference in your life. What you look to in your life will determine many things. And tonight I want to take a look at a couple of things, what you look to, that will show us how it affects our life, how it's going to change our day-to-day, how it's going to change the monotony, how it's going to come and bring the supernatural on the scene. Because when your super goes in, and when your natural goes in, and God puts his super on it, now all of a sudden you have a supernatural existence. What you look to, a couple of things tonight. Number one, what you look to, you are drawn to. What you look to, you are drawn to. Notice Moses was tending the flock, right? He had to have his eyes on those sheep. 
He had to make sure that they were taken care of. He had to make sure that they weren't wandering off doing their own thing. But all of a sudden, he saw something, burning bush, not uncommon maybe in the desert, dry place, could have happened. But now all of a sudden, he didn't just look, now he was looking to, he was inquiring of, he was seeking, he, he was going after it. And what he looked to, he was drawn to. He says, I will now turn aside, see this great sight. You and I have to understand that if we look away from Jesus and look to the world, we'll be drawn to the world. But when we look away from the world and look to Jesus, we'll be drawn to Jesus. Oftentimes when I talk to people and they say, Pastor, I've I messed up and, and I don't know what's going on. And, you know, I, 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 I've been drinking. I've been doing the wrong things, you know. I, I crashed my car, and all this bad stuff's happening to me. I don't know how I fell into this place. I was going strong with God. I was going to church, and then all of a sudden, something happened. What happened? They got their eyes off of Jesus, got their focus off of Jesus. A great friend of mine who helped uh, my wife and I and the, the team at the time that had started the Young Adults Ministry, I remember he said, oh, I'm getting burnt out, and I need a break. I said, okay, you can have a break from serving, but you cannot have a break from church. He ended up taking a break from church, and for three years, I didn't see him. Well, I heard reports of him, crashed his car, messed up, out there in the clubs. Later on, he came back and started to focus on God once again. Hasn't been out of church since. Life is blessed. Married, has kids. I mean, just blessed. What happened? What he focused to, he was drawn to. When he focused on the world, he got drawn into the world. But then when he focused on God, he was drawn back into the things of God. See, you and I have to keep our focus on Jesus each and every day. There's going to be things that distract us. There's going to be things that come along that try and get us off. But God is also there in the midst, a burning bush, a light and a presence and a sign for us, designed for us to turn away from the natural and turn to him. In fact, we see pictures of this all the time in the word. You're there in Exodus. Turn back to the book of Genesis. Chapter number 13, we see this example in a man by the name of Abraham and his nephew, Lot. Genesis, chapter number 13, let me set the scene for you. Abraham has been traveling. He went down to Egypt. Now he's come up from Egypt, and, and, and he goes back to the place where he met up with God. There was an altar, and he went back to that place, and he called on the name of the Lord. Now, a quarrel had broken out between Abraham's servants and Lot's servants because they had so many great possessions. They had so many herds and, and herdsmen that all of a sudden the land couldn't support them anymore. They couldn't stay together as one camp. They had so much stuff and it just it wasn't going to work. And so there's a quarrel breaking out. And so Abram says, okay, Lot, you choose where you want to go. If you go right, I'll go left. You go left, I'll go right. Okay? And so he says, whatever way you choose, I'm going to go the opposite way. And the one who should have had the preference. The older one, the one who was the leader at that time, Abraham, he should have been able to say, I listen, I'm choosing this way. You go that way, right? He should have, but what does he do? He humbles himself and he gives his nephew the choice. Now, Abraham, remember, had, had just come back to the place where he met up with God and called on the name of the Lord. Now, here's Lot, and here Lot has a decision to make. And let's take a look at what happens. Genesis chapter 13, verse number 10. Through verse number 13. Genesis chapter 13, verse number 10 says, And Lot lifted his eyes and saw. Everybody say, and saw. Oh, come on, tonight. You came to church to participate, not just to spectate. Okay? Everybody say, and saw. And saw. And saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go towards Zoar. Verse number 11, then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Verse 12, Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. Now, verse number 13 comes along and says, but the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Now, I want you to know something. It mentions Sodom and Gomorrah several times. It also mentions Egypt in there. Now, Egypt in the Bible we know was bondage. We know that it is a picture of sin. Sodom and Gomorrah 
though we understand because of the use of those terms. I mean, modern day, we don't even use the term Sodom without some sort of gross expression that comes along with it. Because the people that lived there were so exceedingly wicked. Now, Lot looked up, lifted his eyes, and what does he see? He sees a well-watered place. He saw the, the, the place where his flocks could be watered, where there would be grasses for them. He saw this abundance, and he lifted up his eyes, and he was drawn to it. The Bible says that he started to travel east. And then it says that he even pitched his tent as far as the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. But I want you to recognize something. If you read on in the story, this caused Lot a lot of trouble. Are you listening? In fact, throughout Lot's lifetime, you don't find much other than trouble from this point on. The very next chapter, Lot is taken captive in a war. Abraham has to go and save him and take him out. Uh, eventually, we find Lot sitting in the gate of the city. I mean, you don't sit in the gate of the city unless you're one of the elders, one of the leaders of that city. So here Lot is in the city with the wicked people sitting in the gate. And the Bible tells us later on that the things that he saw vexed his righteous soul. My goodness, so unnecessary. He didn't have to have it that way. Eventually, you know, the judgment of God comes in Lot. The angels come to Lot, and they have to grab him by the hand and pull him out of there, him and his family. His wife doesn't make it. She turns around and looks back. That's how entwined their hearts were with the things of this world. She turns into a pillar of salt. A lot flees to the mountains. My goodness, his life is a mess. Why? Because he lifted up his eyes and he was drawn towards the land where wickedness was. Rather than asking the Lord, Lord, where should I go? What should I do? God, where would you have me to go? God, what would you have me to see? God, where would you have me to be? Now, you're still there in Genesis 13? Take a look at verse number 14. Genesis 13, 14 says, And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. In other words, God had already promised Abraham certain things. God had promised to give him land. God had called him out of the land which he was in and told him to travel to the place where he would show him. Now, Lot has separated from Abraham, and God tells Abraham, I want you to lift up your eyes now and look from the place where you are. See, sometimes we get our eyes so focused on the place where we're at. We get our tunnel vision so focused here on earth time and on what's going on right now. This is my present reality, and it's so big to me. Well, this is the reason why, because you've got blinders on. Because it's right here. But if you take this out and you start to look up from the place where you're at, start to look up to Jesus, start to look up to God, start to look to the one who can deliver, start to look to the one who can restore, start to look to the one who can save, start to look to the one who can heal, start to look to the one who can provide. That's your God, and you lift up your eyes from the place where you are, and you start to look around at what God is doing, and not at present circumstances. God will lead you, God will guide you, God will direct you. Lot looked to the land, but Abraham looked to the Lord. We need to do the same thing in our lives and understand that what we look to, we are drawn to. That if we gaze at Jesus, we will get closer and closer to Jesus. But as we look to the world, we'll get closer and closer to the world. Are you listening tonight? First thing, what we look to, we are drawn to. Second thing for tonight, what you look to is where you are led. What you look to is where you are led. Now you say, what's the difference here? Okay, let's, let's find out about it. Remember, Moses turned away from his earthly assignment, talking about the leading, okay? Not just where he was drawn, but where he was led. See, he was on an earthly assignment. He had sheep he was tending to. He had somebody he was accountable to here on the earth, and he was in an earthly occupation. But now God steps on the scene. God intervenes, intercedes, and now God interacts with Moses, and what takes place? He gets a new direction. He gets a new leading. Yes, he was drawn to the presence of God, but now he is led by the presence of God. You understand the difference? And for all of us in this place, we can be drawn to God, we can enjoy the presence of God, but if we don't hear the leading, if we don't hear the voice, then we don't have the vision and the direction that we need. 
And sometimes you say, well, but I don't hear the voice of God. Okay, well, continue doing until you get the direction. You understand? That's why I said, I'm not telling you tomorrow to not go to work. That's why I told you, continue to love your families, continue to build your homes, continue to do the things that you should be doing here on earth. Work with your hands, do your thing, you know, think, read, enjoy your lives. But when God comes on the scene and gives you direction, those things now take second priority. And you understand what I'm saying, not that your wife and kids now get neglected or that your family or your job or that sort of a thing. It's just now God is in those things. And you work those things out together. That's really what this is talking about. Acts chapter 7 in the King James Version, you got the New King James Version. I'll, I'll put it up on the overhead for you in the Old King James Version for you. Acts chapter 7, verse 31 says, When Moses saw it, talking about the burning bush, he wondered at the sight. And as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him. See, when we come into the house of God, when we come into the presence of God, or, you know what, you could be in your car driving and just praying. You could be Home at the shower, singing to the Lord. You could be on your back patio, reading the word. Wherever it is that you get into the presence of God, and as you draw near to God in your heart, now all of a sudden the voice of the Lord can come to you. That's why Gideon was in a wine press. David was on a hill, right? There, there are different people in different places that we find them. And so we have to understand that when we draw near to the presence of God, now all of a sudden the voice of the Lord can come to us. We'll draw near to God and he will do what? He will draw near to you, the Bible says. Let's take a look at this in Hebrews chapter 12. You're there in Genesis. Go with me to Hebrews. You should know where Hebrews is if you come here on Sunday mornings. We go line upon line and precept upon precept Sunday mornings. We've been in the book of Hebrews for a couple years now. And so if you haven't started coming Sunday mornings, you can start coming. Or if you can't make it Sunday mornings, we put the, the uh, messages online for free. You can download them and listen to them and find out what's going on Sunday mornings. It's just rich, and it'll bless you. Hebrews chapter 12, I, see, I automatically turn to Hebrews chapter 5. How many, how many others automatically just say Hebrews 5? Okay, we're going there. No, Hebrews chapter 12, all right? Sunday night. I figured we could use this verse since we won't be there for another uh, decade or so. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1, it says this. It says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Now, I want you to get a hold of this part. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Everybody say the race that is set before us. Good job. Now, see, this is the life that you're living. There is a course that has been laid in front of you that God wants you to run. And so he says, get rid of the stuff that's going to hinder you running. Get rid of the things that will hold you down and hold you back. In other words, look away from those things. Let's run with endurance the race that is set before us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, please. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, I want you to notice something about the next couple words. We had a race that was set before us. Jesus similarly had something that was set before him. A race? Well, yes, he had a course that he lived his life on, that he had to run that he did, he did perfect. But look at it, it doesn't say the race for Jesus was set before him. Look at what it says. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What is it telling us? It's telling us that Jesus had a vision of something that led him to continue on and to endure in his race. What was his vision? What well, was the joy that was set before him? The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah that when he was on the cross, he saw the reward of his sufferings. He saw us. He saw people. He saw past, present, future. When Jesus was on the cross, he saw your face. He saw my face. That's an amazing thing. That's beyond comprehension. You think about the billions of people that have existed over the millennium, and Jesus had an image, had a, a vision, had something that was driving him to endure the sufferings of the cross and the separation from the Father and the weight of sin on the world. What was it? It was us in heaven with him. That's what gave him what he needed to endure the cross, despising its shame. So Jesus had something in front of him. 
That means that we need to put something in front of us. What is it? Jesus, looking unto Jesus. That if we're going to endure the sufferings of this life, that we have to keep Jesus in front of our faces. We have to keep Jesus as the central focus of our lives. It doesn't mean that we neglect our lives. No, it means that Jesus is in the center of our lives. It means that Jesus is the priority in our lives. It means that Jesus is the one who directs our lives. Why? Because he's the author and the finisher of our faith. That means that Jesus has written the script. Jesus has wrote out the story. Jesus knows the path. Jesus knows the answers. Jesus has written the last chapter of the book. And so you don't have to worry about this chapter of the book because your outcome is good. Are you listening tonight? What you look to, number one, you are drawn to. What you look to, number two, is where you are led. Final thing, what you look to has the power to change your life. It has the power to change your life if you'll let it. I don't want to stay the same. I don't want to plateau in my walk with God. I don't want to be status quo, normal. I don't want to be just okay. If that's all we've got, hey... Let me go be with Jesus right now. No, I want to be on an upward climb. I, I want to see the, the summit. And there will come a day where I'll reach that summit. But until then, it's an upward climb. And as you gaze at Jesus, Jesus has the power to change your life if you'll let him. If you let him get on the inside of you and start to rearrange, start to change, start to tenderize your heart, start to mold and make your heart like he wants it to look, start to transform you into his image. Not into the image of the world, not into the image of the way people think that you should be or, or maybe your, your, your family thinks you should be or the lineage that was says you should be. There's all sorts of things trying to pull at us, trying to change us, trying to conform us to its image. You need to look this way. You need to have the perfect body. You need to talk this way. You need to have this level of education. You need to have this amount of money. You need to have this kind of car. You need to buy this kind of soap. You need to eat these kinds of cereals and you need to, I mean, everything is telling us how to live. Problem is, is we're looking to that stuff in the world more than we're looking to Jesus. We're getting confused. We're getting off track, getting out of focus. And a life out of focus is blurry, it's confusing. My goodness. But life in focus, when you look to Jesus, you start to not worry about what you're going to wear because, hey, he closed the flowers of the fields. He could take care of me. Start to not worry about what you're going to eat. Why? Because he feeds the birds. Not one of them has gone without a meal. If you've ever seen those fat little sparrows by McDonald's, my goodness. God can take care of you. Hello. Not worried about what you look like. Why? Because you're fearfully, wonderfully made. You're made in the image of God. And if somebody says you're ugly, say, hey, you're calling God ugly because I'm made in his image. Some of you, when you look in the mirror, you say, ugh, I hate that. Listen, you're going to hate heaven because you're going to get to heaven. God's going to look like you. We're made in his image. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Each and every one of us beautiful in the eyes of God. We're loved. We're valued. And when you look to Jesus, what you look to has the power to change your life. In our examples so far, we've already seen that what Lot looked to changed his life. He had a life with flocks. He had a life with herds. He ends up in a room with his wife and his two daughters, and eventually that's even taken away from him. Abraham looked to the Lord, and he had flocks and herds and men and all that kind of stuff, but the one thing he didn't have, he didn't have a son. Eventually that was given to him, the one thing that he wanted. That was given to him by the Lord. Why? It changed his life. Even at an old age when he was beyond the age of bearing children changed his life. What we behold is what we become. Let me say that again. What we behold is what we become. You behold the world long enough, you'll become worldly. But as you behold Jesus, you'll become more and more like Jesus. As you behold God, you become godly. That's what that word really means, being like God. What we behold is what we become. What you look at the longest, you've heard this, becomes strongest in your life. 
that as you look to the world, the world will become so strong to you. But if you look to Jesus, Jesus will be strong to you. And this can work in the positive or in the negative. Whatever it is that you're looking at. If you focus on money, money is going to control your life. You focus on perversions, sexual sins, that's going to become a stronghold in your life. You focus on negativity and gossip and slander, that's going to become strong in your life. But by the power of Jesus Christ, if you look away from those things and look away from the world and put those things away, laying aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles and you look to Jesus, now Jesus is the strong one. Jesus is the greater one on the inside and greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And now you can start to stand and declare that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Why? Because I'm beholding Him, and I'm becoming like Him. And in His presence, I'm changed. So you allow Him to come and to do His wonderful work. You there in Hebrews, turn with me, last verse for tonight, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Mighty quiet in here. You all still here tonight? Yeah. Praise God. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Last verse. For tonight, 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse number 18. Great verse. would encourage you to commit it to memory or at least remember how to find this verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 18. But we all, with unveiled face. Now, we got to stop right there for a second. Remember our man Moses? Okay, Moses used to get into the presence of God. And there in the presence of God, his countenance started to change. See, the presence of God changed him. And he would walk out of the place where he was at with God. He was in a tent. As he would come out of the tent, because of the presence of God, Moses' face shone with the glory of God. He would glow. Okay? Not just that he was a, a pasty white guy, you know. It, this, was, this was a man out in the desert. He had a tan. And, 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 and so here it was a tan man, but he was glowing with the glory of God. And so, so much so that as he came out, people started to stare. Like, what's up with Moses? You know what I mean? His countenance was changed. And so Moses, because he didn't want the people staring at him, started to put a veil over his face. And so what it's talking about is any time that the Old Testament, the old law is preached, that veil is over the heart. But he says, we all, something different about us, with unveiled face. And that unveiled doesn't mean like Moses where he took it off for a period of time and then he put it back on when he went in the presence of others. No, that means it was taken off and it was thrown away. Now there's nothing stopping us from the presence of God, nothing between us, nothing that covers us up. No, now we are in the presence of God. We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. See, when you look in the mirror, I don't know about you, but I can't even brush my teeth without leaning in and taking a look, you know? You're sitting there taking a look. You lean in, you look, you gaze. Take a look, you see what's going on. You're doing your hair, you're, you're leaning over, you're leaning in. Some of you ladies, when you're doing your makeup, you get that magnification mirror, right? You pull out that thing, you start looking, right? See, that's what we're doing. We're beholding as in a mirror. We're getting closer to, we're drawing near to, we're examining, we're looking at the intricacies. We're seeing every fold and every, every, every different nuance. We can see the different color changes. We can see the, the, the sparkle in the eye. We can see the gleam off the teeth. We can see the light of the presence of God. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. See, when you look to Jesus, when you get in the presence of God, when you get in his word, when you get in, in church, and you behold the Lord, the Spirit of God gets on the inside of you and starts to change, starts to transform. The word transformed is the, in the original language, the same word we get our word metamorphosis from. You understand that like a caterpillar, right? Here comes a little caterpillar, and it goes into a cocoon state. And there in that secret place in that cocoon, after a period of time, it comes out no longer a caterpillar, but a butterfly. What took place? There was a metamorphosis. There was a transformation that took place. Went in one way, came on another. Some of you guys walked in this place tonight feeling like a worm. Didn't put a lot of value on your life. And yet when you get into the presence of God and you allow the power of God to change you from glory to glory, the glory of a man to the glory of God, 
Just as by the Spirit of the Lord, God gets in there in the secret place and does things that you didn't even know could take place. It transforms you into the image of God. It gives you wings so that you can rise up and fly with Him. You might have come in a worm, but you're going to leave a butterfly, beautiful and able to soar to the heights. That's what this is all about tonight. What you look to, number one, you're drawn to. What you look to, number two, is where you are led. And what you look to, number three, has the power to change your life. If you'll let him, he'll change your life. Tonight, if you got something from the word of the Lord, come on, let's give God a great big praise. Hey, I want to talk to some of you guys before we leave this place tonight. I want to make sure that your heart's right with God before you leave. It'd be a tragedy if we came into the house of God, sang together, had a wonderful time in the presence of God, heard the word of the Lord like we did, and then you died and went to hell. It'd be a tragedy. I don't want that. You don't want that. God does not want that. Sometimes people say, well, Pastor, I don't believe in hell. Don't believe in it. Listen, did you know that just because you don't believe in something doesn't make it any less real? It's like burying your head in the sand and saying, you yeah, know, I don't believe in the sun. The sun will be hitting your backside. You could say, I don't believe in semi-trucks. Go stand out on the slow lane of the freeway and say that. Eventually, you will meet one face to face. So just by denying something's existence doesn't make it any less real. You're going to have to deal with it. Hell was never intended for you and I. It was intended for the devil and his angels that rebelled. But we can choose with our life whether or not we go there. And the Bible speaks about hell. Old Testament, New Testament, Jesus talked about it. It's a very real place. So let's make sure you don't go there. Now, sometimes people say, well, I'm not going to go there because, you know, all roads lead to heaven. You get there your way, I'll get there my way, everybody will get there somehow. God's good. He loves everybody. He'll take care of it. Problem with that thing is, you know that nowhere in the Bible should say all roads lead to heaven. Just do whatever you want to do and you can make it. It doesn't work like that. It's like saying all roads lead to the moon. Not all roads lead to the moon. In fact, there's only one way you're going to get there. And don't you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried out in his son Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross, don't you think that he would tell us how to get to heaven if he wanted us there? Well, he does through his word. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means we can't get there your way, can't get there my way, can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. One way we're going to get to heaven, and that's God's way. Now, sometimes people say this, they say, well, pastor, that's good news. I'm going to get there God's way because I've been a good person. I know God lets good people into heaven, and I've been a really good person my, my whole life. You know, I used to be bad. I'll be honest. I used to be bad, but I changed my life. Now, I've been good and done more good than bad, and therefore, uh, God's going to let me into heaven. But the problem, once again, with that thing is nowhere. Check it out. Nowhere in the Bible to say you can be good enough to get into heaven. I don't find any grading scale in the Bible or any amount of goodness that you have to be in order to make it to heaven because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to make it there by being good. In fact, the Bible describes that your goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags and you get thrown out. Not going to make it just by being good. And I love you enough tonight, respect you enough and honor you enough to tell you the truth and not play games. Sometimes people say, well, you know what, I, I understand that, but not only have I been good, I was raised in church. Parents told me that we were Christians growing up. I've always considered myself to be a Christian. I wore religious jewelry as a child, maybe a cross or St. Christopher. You were baptized or christened. Went to religious classes like Sunday school, catechism class, Sabbath school class. And, 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 you know, you're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven denying hell. Right? Wrong. Once again, nowhere. Check it out. Nowhere in the Bible say, because you're raised in church, parents tell you you're Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible to say that you wear religious jewelry, go to religious classes, you consider yourself to be a Christian, baptized or christened as a child, that you get to go to heaven. Again, nowhere in the Bible to say that because you're born in America or that because you're not some other religion that by default God lumps you in the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. If that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, then tonight let me love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Sometimes people say, okay, but not only when I was a child did I go to church. Here I am in church right now. I'm sitting in front of you tonight, Pastor. It's great. I'm glad you're here, but just, just show that to me in the Bible because you're sitting in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. It doesn't work like that. That's like sitting in the ocean, calling yourself a fish, and it makes you a fish. Not going to work. No one in the Bible says sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. 
You say, ah, I understand that, but you know what? In my last church, I got involved. I helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church, and people thought of me as a leader. Taught in the Bible classes and even got a membership card to that church. It's great. I'm glad you did those things, but just show that to me in the Bible, could you, where your church involvement gets you into heaven, where you help out, sing in the choir, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. You teach in the Bible classes, and you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And again, nowhere, nowhere, check it out, nowhere do we see God standing at the gates of heaven in the Bible looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter. It doesn't work like that. You say, but wait, I'm, I'm sort of confused at this point because someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I know about Jesus. Celebrated Christmas just last month. Sing the songs every year of my life. Celebrate Easter and the resurrection. I, I know God. I could quote scriptures to you. Old and New Testament. That's great. Once again, glad you can do those things. But just, just show that to me in the Bible. Nowhere. Check it out. Nowhere does it say that because you know who God is. can quote some scriptures that you get to go to heaven or you celebrate a holiday. That qualifies you for heaven. It doesn't work like that. In fact, if you read your Bible, you'd know that the Bible says that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures in the Bible. And yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. Look up here. It's not about what you have in your head. It's not about some mental ascent towards God. Having head knowledge about who Jesus is and that gets you right with God headed for heaven and denying hell. Still looking? It's about your heart. God's always been after your heart. Beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. God's looking for your heart. Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus in John, the third chapter. You can read it for yourself. And when Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus, he didn't pat Nicodemus on the back and say, hey man, you're a religious leader. You got involved. You've been doing this since you were a kid. You can quote scripture. You've been a really good person. Hey, just keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. He does not say that at all. Rather, what does Jesus say? He says, if you want to get to heaven, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it to the coals, made it out to be something that it's not. But this is not about what society says or Hollywood or television or books or movies or internet. But rather, this is about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean from the Bible? Well, it's always meant the same thing. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. It's an all-or-nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, third chapter. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Well, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say look out? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three, just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to be born again. I want to be headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. Get over that embarrassment. Why do I say that? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? And ever? No one would make that trade. Moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity in hell? No way. And yet, insecurity, yet what other people are going to think of you, all that's going to be speaking to you, saying, oh, no, you can't do this. Listen, push past that. You've got all your heart and all your life tonight in a safe and friendly place. Truth be told, we're all excited for you. We want you to do this. No one's judging you, criticizing you, or condemning you. We're excited for you and have been praying for you. That's why you were invited here tonight. That's what brought you here tonight. It's a divine appointment with God. God wants you to do this. We want you to do this. We're excited for you. And Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who's in heaven. But he also said, if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. Will you give God all of your heart and all of your life, simply acknowledging your need for Jesus by raising your hand? Or you sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right with God. Your call, your choice.
All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe. Get ready to get your hand up. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? You're not sure about your salvation. Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart and all your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I describe it. Come on. You can get right with God by simply raising your hand tonight, and then we'll pray with you. All across this auditorium, wherever you're at, I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, Three, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. Seven, eight, nine. Got you. Anybody else real quick? Nine wise people already. Where are you at? Number 10. Thank you. 10, 11. Got you. 12. Thank you over there. Anybody else real quick? There's a dozen wise people that I already saw. And if I haven't already seen your hand, you count it. If that's you, you need to do this. Just raise it up high for me right now. If that's you. Anybody else real quick? Got 12. Thank you. Number 13. Anybody else? 13 wise people. We're at number 14. You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should. Come on, go for it. That's you. Come on. Come on, just pop it up when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else? 13 wise people. Anybody else real quick? We're at number 14. They're pointing up there. I don't, I don't see a hand anywhere. Where are you at? Just wait. Okay. Directing me down here. Everybody's pointing. Got you right there. You're the one. 14. Praise God. Who else real quick? Who else real quick? We got about 14 wise people. Number 15, you were just waiting for me to say this is the last opportunity. And you said, if he gives one more call, I'll do it. Anybody else real quick? Number 15, if God just spoke to you, come on, he's pulling out your heartstrings. If that's you, come on. You can get right with God in this safe and friendly place. Anybody else? Number 15? Number 15, they're pointing somewhere. There's, there's a hand in the family room. Is that, is that a hand back there? Is that okay? Wave it at me if that's a hand in the family room. All right, praise God. There's number 15. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is so good. All right, all 15 of you, if you're number 16, number 17, number 18, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Hey, it's not too late. In a moment, we're all going to stand and give a clap and a shout. As we do that, Elijah's going to start singing a song. That's your cue as we stand to get your stuff. Coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. And then get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved when you give your heart and life to Jesus. We want to lead you in a prayer, but we can't do that till we get you down here tonight. So let's all stand and welcome them. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Even if you didn't raise your hand, you come right now. Come on down. Come on. Come on. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. From the family rooms, you can bring your kids. They'll remember this. Come on. Still coming, let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. This is your time, this is your moment. From the family rooms, they're coming. Come on, come on, come on. We got room for you up here, come on. All right. Hey, they're, they're coming from the family room right here. Anybody else, if you need to come, just make your way to the front right now. If that's you, come on down. All right, praise God. Hey, everybody up front, take a look up here. Put a big smile on your face. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing, okay? Came to give God all your heart. Came to give God all of your life. Hey, from the inside, it's all going to change from this point forward, okay? Now, right over here to my right, your left, this is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel, okay? He's a really good guy. Nothing weird is going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder if they're weird. He's cool, all right? Let me let you know what he's going to do. Three little things he's going to do. First thing he's going to do, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, okay? You're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do is going to give you absolutely free a little book our pastor wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny, Easy Steps to a Successful Future with God. Okay, you need to find out what to do next. It's real thin, easy reading. You can sit down if you read it slow, maybe 20, 30 minutes, that sort of a thing. And then finally what he's going to do, he's going to introduce you to a friend we have here in the church that we call a spiritual personal trainer. He'll describe how it works. It's easy and it's free and you need to do it, okay? Now, why? Because 
Listen, when I had my kids, I didn't leave them at the hospital and let them fend for themselves, right? I, I had three babies of my own. I didn't just say, hey, hope you guys make it. I'll see you later. It was wonderful carrying you, you know, with my wife for nine months there. Now just do your thing, right? No. We carried them. We nurtured them. And, and, and we're raising them up. In the same way, we're putting in our application tonight to be your church. You say, but I got my own church. Well, listen, you're here tonight. You heard the voice of God here in this church tonight. And you responded to God here tonight. And if you would have died in the place where you were at, you would have died and gone to hell. Now tonight, you're giving God all your heart and all your life. You're going to be born again. And now we want to give you the help that you need to grow strong and healthy in the ways of the Lord. Now listen, I'm going to make a promise to you. You give us one year here at this church. Sit under the teaching here at The Rock. God will give the rest of your life back to you blessed. And this last year, you will look back on and say, man, I didn't know it could be this good. That's our promise to you. It all starts with a spiritual personal trainer. All right? You guys make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right this way. Love you, Pastor Joel.